reinventing public consultation, the first five years of Mass LBP. And because this is a uh, sort of a five-year anniversary thing, uh, one of the things that Mass LBP is trying to do is get their core talks recorded. So I guess you can share it more, more widely. And, uh, and so um, Peter's going to start off by giving his core talk. Uh, and you'll see that we're kind of wired in for uh, recording there in the back. And then uh, I know a lot of us are going to want to hear, especially some of the students, about uh, the, sort of the business side of, uh, of having a startup and consulting business like this and, and getting into the public consultation business. So I know Peter's off to talk more about that after that's uh, after the core talk. So uh, Peter McLeod is co-founder and principal of Mass LVP, an innovative firm based in Toronto which works with visionary governments and corporations to deepen and improve public consultation and engagement. Uh, he writes and speaks frequently about the citizens' experience of the state, uh, the importance of public imagination, and the future of responsible government. Uh, so please join me in welcoming Peter McLeod to the podium. Thank you. Uh, it, it's really fun. I'm a graduate of the University of Toronto, and I tell you, uh, there wasn't a school of public policy and governance in my day. But that was so very long ago. But I certainly would have spent a lot of time hanging out in this building had it existed. And so it's, a, it's an extra special pleasure to be invited in on the occasion of, yes, I know it's a fairly modest thing, our first five years of Mass, uh, to talk uh, about the work that we do. Uh, and as you kindly explained, uh, we're recording this so that we can actually get, you know, these are the sorts of things that startups finally get around to doing, recording the talk that you've given uh, many times before, uh, so that you can get it out on, on, uh, online. One of the things that we're very keen to do is, is be as open uh, about our work as possible uh, and to, uh, to share our practice, uh, which I'm going to spend a fair bit of time this afternoon trying to describe. Uh, in fact, the, the first sort of uh, 20 minutes of, of this are really about the, the thinking behind uh, Mass LVP, some of the theory. Uh, that informs what we do, and, and, and then I'm going to get into some practical examples of exactly how we do it. So we, we have this, this funny strap line, this idea of reinventing public consultation, and, and here we are now at our, our fifth anniversary, right? There are um, actually six core staff members. We've got a, a stable of facilitators here in Toronto, um, in uh, Atlanta, Canada now, in Alberta, BC, we work across the country. We've had 26 digits join us over the course. Now, what is a digit at Mass LBP? We spend so much time trying to be kind and thoughtful and democratic. The digit is our term for, a, well, an intern, right? So we've had 26 interns with us. And in fact, the very first intern is sitting with us, Patrick Vaughn, who's just uh, about to wrap up at the University of Toronto as well. So what's one of the remarkable things is uh, a company that began with just, uh, well, a few handful of people has actually uh, grown and expanded and, and involved uh, many young people, actually, in, in its development. But the first thing I need to address, because it's the question, of course, uh, we always get, is why did you call your business Mass LBP? Uh, what, what does that mean? Well. You know, there, we spend so much of our time working at the intersection between 21st century mass society and 18th century public institutions that struggled to keep up that the idea of focusing on mass society made sense. But then we found this really beautiful quote from Thomas Paine who says that there's a massive sense that lies in the dormant state that good government should quietly harness. And at least in my ear, that's probably one of the most beautiful descriptions of what that relationship uh, effectively rendered between the citizen and the state uh, might, might resemble, right? It, this isn't about placards. It isn't about gathering on the steps of Queen's Park. It's also, for any of the public servants in the room, not about you know, the public engagement initiative that ate the institution, right? where it's all public engagement all the time, but it's a sustained conversation between government and its people. Um, we had this idea of reinventing public uh, consultation. We're a private company, but with this real sense of public mission, we want to reinvent public consultation, because as I'm going to try and explain, I, I frankly think a lot of public consultation goes on 
is kind of useless, right? And there's actually the good people at, at NBC. You couldn't have paid them enough to put a clip like this together. I'm sure a few of you, at least in this building, are familiar with the show Parks and Recreation, right? <laughs> So they, they have this little 30-second clip, which does a very good job of describing, I think, the, the status quo when it comes to public engagement. They are the men and women on the front lines for improving their community. Every month, the Parks Department has a public forum, and they always send me. It's pretty cool. Whatever. I don't know. I don't care. But it's an honor. No one else wants to do it. You go to some sweaty rec center and get yelled at by the public. I hate the public. <laughs> <laughs> Stupid. From the people who bring you the office, Amy Poehler in Parks and Recreation. Thank you so much for coming. What an amazing turnout. Thursday, <laughs> April 9th on NBC. So there you go, right? And it's good to laugh. It's okay to laugh. I hate the public. The public is stupid. No one's come out. Because if you've ever tried to conduct some sort of public meeting or discussion, much of this will be familiar to you, right? It becomes about the usual suspects if anyone comes out at all. And, you know, while I think it makes for great satire, what it really does is give us permission to talk about this status quo and how it is that we might be able to do it a little bit better. So, you know, just to kind of characterize some of the problems with status quo, and this is a caricature, right? I mean, I'm, I'm trying to be a little bit provocative here and, and paint a bit of a picture, but we end up wasting our time. We waste the public's time. Often, it feels like we're just going through the motions. And as public consultation becomes more embedded in our public sector institutions, it often becomes just one more box that has to be ticked on your merry way through the policy process. So, you know, part of the problem is that um, we have this sense in a democracy, right, that we are governed by the people, right? That's what democracy is about. It's supposed to be governed by the people, and public consultation should support that good governance. I'd like to argue that it's not so much that we're governed by the people, it's that so often we're governed by our assumptions about the people. And a lot of those assumptions, false assumptions, happen to be reinforced by these standard status quo public consultation events. What I'm trying to work up to is this idea that public consultation is something which is designed, right? And we have a series of design problems that we need to solve for if we're going to have a more effective dialogue. So in a democracy that is governed by the people, we have this idea that a town hall meeting is somehow the paragon of democracy, right? If you want to be really democratic, you find the largest room that you can, and you say, bring in the public, right? We'll go to Con Hall, or we'll go to Varsity Stadium, Biggest space we can find. The problem is, how do we know when the public's there? You know, we misuse the term public constantly. Frankly, I think it makes a much better adjective than it does a noun. Because, of course, it's not like Noah's Ark. I can't just point to folks two by two and count them up and then know when the public's arrived, right? Publicness as an adjective is a way of thinking. It's about uh, public-mindedness public spirit, and that's often an easier thing to recognize in a room than the public itself. I'll say more about this later on, but just let's go through the kind of caricature of a typical town hall meeting. We probably have a room larger than this. We probably would have booked this meeting after some decisions had already been made. Could be that those decisions weren't so popular. Time to hear from the community. Uh, we've given fairly short notice. Um, I'm not just going to be standing in front of you, I'm probably going to be elevated on a platform, right? And I'll have at least one or two microphones set up on the floor. And I'm going to uh, feel a bit anxious because I've got to defend a decision or a policy to a bunch of strangers. So I'm feeling a little Mm, you know, agitated about it, but I'm going to try and, and do my very best. And, and then I'm going to ask the people who've turned out to do the one thing that people genuinely hate to do uh, in any part of this country, perhaps in any part of this world, 
stand in, from a, stand in front of a room full of strangers and do public speaking, right? Most people would probably rather die uh, than actually stand in front of a room full of strangers and say their piece. And I'm going to get to do it, I'm going to ask them to do it when, when they're frustrated, probably when they're upset, and when they've had to wait for eight or nine other people to say their piece, not respecting the time limits, right? So again, this, these are all design choices that end up being almost inadvertently made, that set up a dynamic that ends up becoming very hostile. In fact, I would love someday to get a, a nurse or a GP with like a heart rate monitor or some neural probes and to put it on the people standing at that microphone. Because I don't think they're so angry or crazy in and of themselves. I think we probably drive them a little mad in this interaction. And, I, it, and it, it, it's a bit comical, but I think the bigger problem is that it's just not fair. It's not a responsible way to set up a dialogue between equals, right? So we had this idea that town halls equal democracy. I prefer to say that they equal annualism. We then think to ourselves, well, if that's a problem, wouldn't it be better if we did it all online? And I got to say, having been a student here in the mid to late 90s, working actually on one of the original democracy online initiatives at the McLuhan Program for Culture and Technology, um, what we were trying then, hasn't, the graphics have improved, but not a whole lot more. Right? And the arguments that get made around online consultation are, are, are pretty easy to recite. It's probably going to cost less money. We'll, we'll save on the room and the coffee and the donuts. Um, it'll be more convenient to people. Right? We'll reach more people. That's usually one. We'll reach more people. It'll be more convenient to them. And one of the convenience arguments that gets made is, is not only um, that people can kind of do it at the, the time of their choosing, inevitably someone will say to me, in fact, it'll be so easy, folks have laptops, they'll probably just do it in bed wearing their pajamas at night. Which is kind of a peculiar argument about democratic practice, that it's something that we want to be doing, wearing our pajamas, just typing into uh, a laptop, right, with the glow of the screen in the evening. I don't think that's what it's about at all. And in fact, despite all the hype around trying to do this online, many of those I'm sure in this room who've experimented with it have found that in fact, um, it's really just a sophisticated online comments box um, because oftentimes people are anonymous, they're more inclined to just sound off, right? And the whole thing starts to look more like the comments section of the Toronto Star or the Globe and Mail by the time you're done. So we come at this in a slightly different way. We, we think we need to work to correct these assumptions that we come to hold about that phantom public because of the ineffective ways in which we are trying to convene and engage with it. It paints a picture, if, if you spend all of your time trying to hold town hall meetings or convince people to log on at night, you come to view the public as something that is highly polarized, right? 50% of people want one thing, 50% of people want the other. That's really volatile, right? It's, it's laden with emotion and protest and defensiveness. So it's emotional, but it's also usually quite uh, ill-informed, right? That people are arguing from their perceptions of things, but that might not correspond with reality. Now, if you are a good public servant or you're being trained as a public servant, then if you're confronting this kind of phenomenon, something that feels volatile and polarized and emotionally informed, the natural professional response is to regard this as a risk that needs to be managed. And how do you manage that risk guarding against this volatile public? You start putting even greater guardrails and bumpers around that interaction. So you start to constrain the kinds of questions that can be asked, right? You constrain the amount of time that there is for dialogue. All of the good inclinations about transparency and genuine engagement kind of fall by the wayside because what, we're re what, what we really are is afraid. We're afraid that someone's going to come at us, right? Or that they're going to embarrass us. Or that they're going to try and shred whatever it is we're doing. Now, you won't be surprised to hear that mass is founded on a different set of assumptions about the public, right? Uh, and it might sound a little bit kind of Care Bears in kindergarten, but we view the public as something different. And 
At times, it can feel like a leap of faith. Believe me. But it's the idea that the public actually, members of the public care about more than their own self-interest, that they are uh, reasonable people at the end of the day, that, that people want to be a part of something bigger than themselves, right? They care about their communities, they want it to have purpose, and that they're actually fundamentally curious, right, about um, the affairs of their community and their society. And it's especially this last one, where I don't think we often give people enough credit. And in part, that's because, it's funny saying this in a, in a university, but as public servants, as people working in the public sector, we're not always very good at sharing what we know, right? Of, of teaching and co-learning around the kinds of policy questions we're attempting to address. But if you start with these assumptions rather than those other assumptions, you start to regard the public differently. You begin to see them as a, as a resource uh, rather than a risk. And I think that's a much better place to begin. So everything that follows in my talk is really about just trying to move this dominant view of the public as a risk to be managed in the policy process uh, towards the public as a resource that can be tapped. And it's tapped for three very simple reasons. One, if you do it well, it's going to increase the legitimacy of uh, the policy choice that you're making. Uh, it's going to enhance trust uh, with the constituency that's affected. And then last, ideally, you're going to make a better decision as a result of this conversation. With me so far? So what we're trying to do, and I want to be clear, is not anything as crude as let's put the people in charge, right? This isn't kind of referenda-based populism here. It's simply trying to rebalance the conversation because, in fact, we live in an open society. If you are a determined individual, you will be able to find a way to make yourself heard. Um, certainly, lobbies, associations, community groups can advance their perspectives to their representatives, to uh, officials, and there are channels through which they can do that. But actually discerning what is in the broader public interest, that's a much harder, and I think interesting, Task. So I've got just one other quick video clip from a guy named Barry Schwartz, uh, who's a psychologist. In Switzerland, back in uh, about 15 years ago, they were trying to decide where to site nuclear waste dumps. There was going to be a national referendum, and some psychologists went around and polled citizens who were very well informed. And they said, would you be willing to have a nuclear waste dump in your community? Astonishingly, 50% of the citizens said yes. They knew it or thought it was dangerous. They thought it would reduce their property values, but it had to go somewhere, and they had responsibilities as citizens. The psychologists asked other people a slightly different question. They said, if we paid you six weeks' salary every year, would you be willing to have a nuclear waste dump in your community? Two reasons. It's my responsibility, and I'm getting paid. Instead of 50% saying yes, 25% said yes. What happens is that the second, this introduction of the incentive gets us so that instead of asking what is my responsibility, all we ask is what serves my interests. So I think this is an interesting case study, right? And in fact, psychologists and political scientists have subsequently asked um, members of other communities similar questions. Because you might be sitting there thinking, yeah, well, that's all nice, but you're talking about Switzerland. <laughs> and they're a little different, right? Uh, but in fact, no. I mean, we've, we've seen studies that have uh, simply reframed the question from a matter of self-interest to a matter of public interest in North America and in Europe, and you get completely different results. And, and this might seem to be a slightly um, either semantic or pedantic point, depending on, on how you view it. But, you know, it always winds me up when I'm going into the offices of some of my clients, and it's so well-intentioned, but they, they have little posters, you know, on, on bulletin boards that say things like, come have your say, tell us what you think, your voice, your government, your community, your action, all that kind of really individualistic language, 
which not as overtly as saying we'll put money in your pocket versus what's in the interest of the best community, but I wonder if it doesn't get people thinking from that second frame of mind rather than the first frame of mind. And I think it's, I think it's an important distinction to make throughout all of this work. And I'll, I'll explain in a moment just how we affect it through our, through our programs. So we appeal to people's sense of self-interest. We forget to appeal to their sense of public interest. All right, so how does this actually work? Um, when we're designing a public engagement program, we're going after four things. If you're designing something, you need to have goals. And the first goal probably seems really self-evident. It's this idea that the recommendations that come out of this citizen engagement process should be useful. Like I said, it sounds like it should be self-evident. But how often have you gone, gone through some sort of public process where uh, you get blue sky ideas, you get a laundry list of to-dos, none of which bear any correspondence to the political reality, certainly to the economic reality, maybe to the amount of time, right? So to get recommendations that you can use, you have to design for that up front. The second is that as a result of this uh, process that we want to enhance institutional trust and transparency. And yet how often do people walk out of that proverbial town hall meeting saying, oh, you know, the decision's already been made, they weren't really listening, right? Something that's intended to increase that, that transparency and trust actually diminishes it as often as not. Um, the third is a kind of a, a maskism, uh, a, a term that we came up with a few years ago to describe really what we're after in terms of the individual's experience. We want people walking out, not just saying that they feel like it was heard and they had, were able to contribute to the decision, but actually that they felt their own sense of democratic fitness enhanced. Now, many of you are familiar with the idea of civic literacy, uh, this idea that, well, Canadians would be more engaged if they could just name their first prime minister, um, or uh, if they had a, a better grasp of history all around. So we think all of that's uh, maybe necessary, but it's, it's not sufficient. You're probably all familiar with the, um, the Aaron Brockovich story, or at least the movie with Julia Roberts, right? Erin um, didn't know who her senator was, she didn't know how a bill became law, but what she had was a real sense of moral courage, right? Uh, we want, and she had a sense of personal efficacy. We want people to leave a public process with that sense of efficacy um, and, uh, and voice uh, enhanced and reaffirmed. That's what we mean by democratic fitness. The last is this idea of organizational learning. Um, and what we mean by that is uh, it's not just enough for the citizens to walk away uh, feeling uh, more empowered or more esteemed. It's actually important that the organization, the commissioner of this process, the client, um, has changed, has experienced some sort of cultural change as a result of that encounter. And in fact, even though we're known for all of our public engagement, truth be told, we probably spend as much or more time working on the inside of our clients' organizations so that they're in a kind of ready state to be able to accept and integrate the input that they ultimately get out of that public conversation. So those are the, those are the four things we look for. Useful recommendations, enhanced trust and transparency, democratic fitness, and organizational learning. Now, we ask ourselves four other questions which lead us to the kind of core mass design in all of this. Um, and I think this is applicable in any situation where you're trying to involve the public. The first is, who's in the room and how did they get there? Like I said, there's, always this, there's already this, this kind of definitional problem with the public, right? How do you convene them effectively? You know, uh, you'll never walk down University Avenue and go by the um, uh, courthouse and see a, a sandwich board outside that says, murder trial this afternoon, jurors wanted. For really good reason. <laughs> right? And yet every time a school board decides that it wants to consolidate its facilities, or a hospital wants to relocate 
services. That's effectively what they do. They put a sandwich board out front that says murder trial this evening. <laughs> Jurors want it. So who do you think comes? Probably parents, right? Who certainly have a, a, a clear reason for being there, right? And at the hospital, it, it's going to be patients or people who rely on those services. But the, how does it become possible to have that wider conversation about the fact that you're living in a community that's aging, where there are only 100 kids to fill that school anyway, where you might be able to offer different services, so on and so forth. So who's in the room and how did they get there? The second is, are you asking people for their opinion or to represent the views of others? And this is an important, nuanced thing, point. Um, I don't think that democracy is ultimately about the aggregate of individual interests. It's not just a counting exercise. It's not just a crude majoritarianism. And it can certainly feel that way, given all the emphasis we put on elections, as opposed to the other kinds of democratic encounters we might have as citizens. Um, I think the, the real essence of democracy is how members of the same community can understand their shared challenges and together work out shared solutions, right? And, and that's, a, that's an act of, of profound empathy. That means that you have, you have to be able, uh, really, to try and put yourself, it's not any more complicated than this, put yourself in someone else's shoes and to try and understand their issues and concerns as well as you're capable of articulating your own. We always challenge our participants to try and put themselves in other people's shoes, to use their voice as a proxy for others. Um, and that's part of the learning process. That's part of internalizing all of the different dimensions uh, that go into complex policy making. All right, all that well and good. Is there a real task, you know, um, for all of these feel-good ideas about citizens and the public? At the end of the day, I've certainly learned that Canadians are hard-headed northerners. We don't like talk for the sake of talk. We want to get something done. So um, don't just ask me to tell you what I think. Let me help you solve this problem. And it taps into more of that kind of barn-raising ethos. But to invite people to help you solve a problem actually requires often more of that public servant or that public agency than simply trying to take the temperature. It means putting on the table all the bits and pieces and that blueprint and saying, okay, can is this the structure we want to create? How do we raise its walls? How do we all pitch in? So we always make it very clear that we are working to complete something together, and we can't complete it if we don't have everyone's commitment and everyone's energy. The last is, uh, just going back to the point about curiosity, what learning needs to occur? You know, I actually think we end up sort of patronizing the public a little bit in this idea that, you know, all opinions are equal, all opinions are valid, everyone's coming in, with, everyone's experience is valid, right? But, but let's not pretend that there are often huge gaps when it comes to how much people know or understand. I mean, the, governments do this all the time, you just survey, um, what do you think the, the budget is for the city of Toronto or the annual budget for the province of Ontario or Canada? People are off by like quantum, right? They're not, they're not even in the ballpark. So there's actually a lot of learning that needs to go on in order for you to be able to come up with a more nuanced view of the issue. And um, that means that we end up thinking more like adult and balanced way. Okay, so all of that leads us to the kind of twin mass methodologies for trying to reinvent public consultation. And the first one uh, is called a civic lottery. Uh, why do we call it a civic lottery? Well, we want people to feel good about winning, which is kind of a peculiar thing. Uh, and the second is this idea of a citizen's reference panel. So a, a civic lottery is a random representative selection process. And we joke that the reference panel, where it's a government agency uh, referring an issue to a group of citizens who can refer back a recommendation as a big ask and a clear task. And it's a big ask because we don't ask people to give us a couple hours of their time. We ask them to give us four, five, six Saturdays or weekends of their time over the course of a couple of months. 
So let me start by talking about the Civic Lottery. In fact, right now there are 10,000 of these brown packaged beauties floating around the province of Ontario to randomly selected households. Um, this is for a project for the Ministry of Consumer Services right now, uh, which is about to embark on an 18-month process to review the Condominium Act. Uh, inside this envelope, there are a series of materials that look like this. We, we, we spend, it seems so old school, direct mail, right? Uh, but we spend a lot of time crafting this. This isn't about coming in and telling us what you think. It's about serving your community. It is an act of public service. That's what we're appealing to. That's the psychology of this. So we take great care with the letter, which is addressed to the individual's name, and it's signed by the minister, it's signed by the head of the hospital, etc. And inside you'll find a candidate response card, and you'll find this buck slip that you pin to your refrigerator, and you, have, you send back an envelope, or you call us on the 1-800 number. It's actually quite involved, even more pieces of paper in this envelope than, than this example. We typically send it to five to 10,000 households, um, we ask people to volunteer. Remarkably, at a time when it seems impossible to get, you know, a dozen people out to a town hall meeting, we have a 47% response rate, which means that if I send out 10,000 of these beauties, I'm going to get four, five, six hundred, seven hundred people replying to us. And I always think to myself, um, how many people wanted to volunteer but simply couldn't because in one of those four weekends, it was their daughter's wedding, or they were graduating from something, you know, like there was just something they couldn't change. So I actually expect that the level of interest, right, uh, the willingness to participate is a good deal higher than those who actually respond. And from that group of, uh, let's say, 300 people, we will then randomly select 24 to 36 to participate. We select for just three criteria, age, so it will typically be four age cohorts from 18 plus to 71 plus. Um, gender, half men, half women, which makes it you know, automatically a good deal better than our legislature. Um, and geography. So if it's a city, we'll break it into wards or districts. If it's a province, we'll break it into regions, whatever might make sense. And so what you end up having is a broadly representative group, but you might be saying, yeah, fine, those are three nice criteria. What about things like um, ethnocultural diversity? What about um, education? What about income? And one of the really good news things I, can, I get to report after five years of doing this, because we've sent out uh, almost 20 of these lotteries to almost 120,000 households across the country in three provinces now, is that each and every time, Within a few percent, uh, ethnicity, income, and education comes out in the wash. What that means is that this opportunity to serve the public, to serve one's community, is as interesting to new Canadian as it is to established Canadian, as to someone with an advanced degree, as to someone who didn't finish uh, their secondary education, um, as it is to someone who is very wealthy, to someone who isn't. So I think that says actually something very positive, not only about the process, but as a, about our society as a whole. That gets us into the citizen's reference panel itself. Uh, I've talked about the convening stage. That's how we bring people together. We then design a curriculum. And we will spend typically a, a third of the entire process learning about the issue. And we invite people in from all sides. It might be frontline staff, it might be someone from an association, uh, it'll certainly be the executive of that agency uh, and some of their experts on staff uh, to talk about the issue from all sides. One of the questions we often get is, well, this is all well and good, but what about everybody who wasn't ultimately selected to be a part of it or never received the letter and they want to have a, a way to have a, a, a say? Um, we hold what we call a public <laughs> roundtable meeting where anyone can come. Uh, what's really lovely there is that we step out of the way as facilitators. And so at each of the roundtables, you've got two of the panelists hosting the discussion. Now it's citizens talking to citizens, unmediated, totally lowers the temperature in the room. Um, we work through an exhaustive deliberation uh, process, and ultimately they come out with a series of recommendations. Now the recommendations... Um, aren't unanimous. It's not about getting perfect consensus, but it's a strong majority view. And anyone who really disagrees 
with uh, one or more of the recommendations can write what we call a minority report that gets slipped into the back of the document. So we don't waste a lot of time trying to make sure everybody agrees. What we want is a, a high degree of consensus, which I actually think is the norm in most, in most democratic societies. Um, this is what it this looks like. Uh, recent, well, actually a project more than a year ago now uh, in Halton. Uh, here they are working on the curriculum. Very basic stuff. They were talking about municipal priorities. Well, lots of people have to figure out what exactly does a region do, right? Like I know what the city of Burlington does, I think. What is a region? Oh, I'm kind of confused. Okay, so we're just going to go through an exercise to make it really clear that these roads are taken care of by the region, and Ontario Works is taken care of by this, and they're doing the library system, and we're doing so on and so forth. But that takes up a lot of time, right? Just to make sure that people have the basics. And it's not us being didactic at the front of the room, like I'm being today. It's, um, it's about kind of shared learning, peer learning going on. And it's a very iterative process, right? It's not just about having a great idea. It's about having a great idea and convincing other people. And then refining that idea and working it out again and again. This is a public roundtable meeting. You can see some cards at the table. Uh, so I think uh, this gentleman and, and probably this fellow here were chairing the meeting and they're laying out a couple of issues and they're soliciting feedback. Each table has a theme so that you don't uh, have to listen to people talk about issues you're not interested in. You want to talk about the economics of it, boom, you go to the economics table. You want to talk about the social implications, boom, you go to the social table. Um, there have to be tough choices. You know, uh, public engagement isn't just about like holding hands and, and, and singing together, right? Um, I, I think we, uh, again, sort of patronize the public with this idea that uh, you can have everything you want, right? And it's kind of a, it's a, it's a political uh, tactic, unfortunately. You have, you have whatever you want, we'll figure it out later. So, well, no, people take the whole thing seriously when you say, no, you can't have everything. There's no way to square this circle. We have to make some tough choices, and that's what makes this process real, and it's what makes your commitment and involvement in it so important, right? Because as this little group of 36, we have to try and discern what is in the broader long-term interest of this entire community. So they work through determining their priorities. Here's a gentleman who's holding up his card about tourism promotion. We expect the region and act in more aggressive planning. The last part of this, after they've bundled up all of their recommendations, is uh, one of my favorite moments in the whole reference panel process. And, and sometimes we think we maybe get a little too cute with all this stuff, right? Uh, we have a um, public service ceremony where this is Gary Carr, former speaker of the Ontario legislature, now regional chair. We print out a certificate and we present it to them to thank them for the time and the investment of energy. We got this idea actually, in fact, virtually everything we're doing comes out of a process that some people here may, be, uh, may remember in 2006, the Ontario Citizens Assembly and Electoral Reform. And that's when the government sent out 100,000 letters, 7,000 people volunteered not to spend four or five Saturdays together, but 16 weekends over the course of nine months right? um, to look at the issue of electoral reform. 103 were selected. And after they completed the learning phase, where they heard from international experts on different electoral systems, the academic director from Queen's University felt that it was really important to honor the hard work that these 103 people had had. Uh, Done. And so he, he argued for some time in an evening when he could present a certificate. Because he also knew that, like the Ontario population, uh, demographically balanced, the majority uh, hadn't been to university. Right? Uh, many of them hadn't completed uh, high school. And so uh, he held this ceremony, and one woman came up to him at the end, and he, he's told me this story, and I always relay it because it's so powerful. And the woman came up to him and said, I can't tell you how much this has meant to me. Neither my, my husband nor I finished high school. Uh, and we just got to go see our daughter graduate last month from high school, first one in her family. And I get to take the certificate home to her after this weekend and show her that her mom's graduated too. And you just kind of like, no. That's what I mean by democratic fitness. Let me assure you that no one planning a uh, nine-month process to study electoral reform 
ever imagine that they would have that kind of personal impact on the citizens who were ultimately selected to play that role. But to me, that's the sort of thing that happens when you're doing it right. It reminds us that government isn't just some foreign technical institution. Government is a social institution. And we need to design for that social experience. We need to design for social development in this work. OK, so a couple questions we often get. Um, so what do you say to people? Like, does it mean that the government's automatically going to do whatever it is they recommend? Well, no. Uh, we've started to implement what we call the dual contract, right? And so the first contract is, well, what we're going to do and what we're going to get paid for. And the second contract is what they're going to do with the uh, recommendations they receive. And, and they're binding, but in a way. They have to publicly acknowledge that this process is taking place. It's not like a focus group that you can just kind of sweep behind the curtain. Right? So it's got to be on their website. They've got to do a press release about it. They've got to be confident in talking about the process. They have to uh, respond to the recommendations in great detail. And they've got to make a kind of goodwill effort to act, not on all of the recommendations, um, but on those that make sense. And one of the happiest days at our office, about a, a year ago in this winter, uh, came when the Ottawa Hospital, which we had worked with, cancer patients and the transformation of of their whole cancer center had come up with about 108 recommendations um, for how they could improve care. And they mailed back to us a year later this 30-page document, which was in like classic um, bureaucratic forms, this like wild Excel document with all these columns. And you know, here was the recommendation, and here was the response, and here was the action, and it was all color-coded, you know, like red and yellow and green. You know what I'm talking about, right? <laughs> And they didn't just send it to us, and they didn't just send it to the 36 members of that, that panel who had been patients. They sent it to everyone who had indicated an interest in participating in the process. To me, that is real accountability, right? Um, we think about the citizen's reference panel as a generic. If you want to call it a citizen advisory panel or a citizen panel or whatever you like, so be it. But we see it as a kind of catch-all into which you can pour all kinds of other engagement processes so that the panel, it just becomes fodder for their deliberation. Um, just to give you an example, you know, uh, there have been about 18 lotteries. There are uh, sort of 20 lotteries. There have been about 18 panels that have either been completed or in process right now. Um, Halton, I showed you some pictures of uh, one of the, uh, you know, uh, earlier projects we did that has received a lot of attention has been a project with Northumberland Hills Hospital, Port Hope and Coburg, where we convened, we sent a letter to one in 12 households for five Saturdays before Christmas. One of our strongest ever response rates, because people in Port Hope and Coburg are really engaged, right, in the going on at their hospital. And they had to balance the budget. The only way they could balance that budget was to uh, eliminate services. And, you know, this... At the end of the day, the health minister, when she was asked questions about this process, stood up and said, actually, I think um, this is a model for other hospitals to use. Not because they held a parade you know, down the main street of Coburg, because now certain services were being transferred to clinics or to Peterborough Hospital, uh, but because what typically happens when these kinds of cuts occur didn't happen. There weren't big protests. Um, donations to the hospital foundation didn't crater. Volunteers didn't walk in. There wasn't labor unrest. People knew that tough choices had to be made, but they felt like it was a heck of a lot better that they get to make them than some supervisor coming in from the ministry of Queen's Park making them on their behalf. Um, I mentioned that we're just getting underway with the uh, Ontario Residents Reference Panel on Modernizing the Condominium Act. Listen, it's all glamour at Mass LVP, folks. Um, and actually flying out this evening to complete the fourth of four Saturdays uh, with a group of 36 citizens convened by Calgary Arts Development. Uh, we have the mayor, uh, Menchi, at the, the first meeting of this group. They're putting forward their ideas for the city's long-term arts investment plan. So I'm just going to give you one more example, and then I'm going to wrap up and take, uh, take your questions. It's often said that the third rail of Canadian politics is, uh, is Medicare, right? 
and um, I have to sort of protect the innocent and just 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 say that the government was interested in having a conversation uh, with Ontarians uh, about the sustainability of the health system. The politics being politics, they are also concerned about um, uh, upcoming election. Uh, and uh, we ended up going uh, to PricewaterhouseCoopers uh, to fund this project. Uh, so we'll just leave it at that. Um, Pricewaterhouse uh, agreed to fund an effort to bring to send out 10,000 letters. Uh, we selected 28 citizens uh, to look at the whole health system, right, and what might be some. Uh, strategic priorities, right? How do we bend the cost curve in healthcare responsibly? We only had three weekends. We ought to have had six, or maybe 16, right? As a whole health system. And in some ways, this was a demonstration project. So we sent out our letters. We had a really strong response rate. We flew people down to the Lee Caching uh, Center at St. Mike's. Um, we asked them, and, and this language is important, this was in the terms of reference, we said you, you, you're here to learn about the province's health system, understand the challenges, and consider the choices we will need to make to ensure the sustainability of high quality, accessible, and publicly funded health care to all Ontarians. So there were some delimiters in there, like publicly funded, we weren't getting into a public-private debate. Um, it, so it was about sustaining the system, but by making some choices to do so. Um, here I am in kind of classic Donkey Kong pose. <laughs> uh, there are the 28 uh, citizens uh, gathered. Uh, this, like, I mean, SPPG students here are paying good money, right, uh, to have a, a premier education. These guys got it better, right? In the three weekends, we had everyone from your exalted leader, Mark Stabile, uh, Matthew Mendelssohn, Austin Brown, the, the kind of blue ribbon of healthcare in this province, as well as uh, frontline staff talking about everything from uh, community care uh, to uh, waiting lists, emergency rooms, pharma, e-health. Uh, it was such a rich discussion. We went from 4 p.m. Uh, on Friday till about 9.30 at night. We started again at 8 a.m. and went on till about 9 p.m. Saturday night. We went again from 8 a.m. till midday, your jaw is hanging open, uh, on the Sunday, and people were like a limp ray, kind of staggering back to their cars and buses. And you know what's cool about that? People were hungry for it, right? It's not only that we underestimate how curious they might be, we often underestimate how committed they're willing to be if you put something real and meaty and juicy in front of them, right? So, Three weekends, we have 20 speakers, 400 slides, a bit like this afternoon, and 48-odd uh, <coughs> recommendations that they came up with. And, and we weren't sure how this measured up. Um, like I said, it wasn't as comprehensive as it might have been. You could have spent a lot more time. But we sent it to, um, and it, it talked about all these things, physician pay, difficult issue, preventative health, a family health team system integration. Uh, we sent it to uh, Andre Picard at the Globe and Mail. Right? Pretty good uh, adjudicator of these things. And he came back and said, finally, it's a healthcare paper that makes sense. That was after three weeks. So uh, that gave us confidence to both take on bigger, high profile issues like the health system, um, while we continue to work on still very local uh, issues in communities as well. You know, as I start to wrap up here, um, I think that. Politics, certainly in the, in the 20th century, was a conversation about what does the public want. Like, big, big picture. Free market economy, something different. Some version of liberal democracy, something different. Um, we have, by and large, figured out, big picture, as a society, what the public wants. I think the really tough question in 21st century politics is to figure out what is the public for? And I don't mean for as a synonym for want. I haven't figured out a better way to express this. But, but what do we actually have for the public to do? I mean, besides paying your taxes and you know, not speeding on the gardener 
um, right, and uh, voting periodically. What does the state need of people, right? And I think there's this huge reservoir of civic capacity that is just waiting there to be tapped. There's a massive sense lying in the dormant state that good government quietly harms. So answering this question in, in more inventive, more creative ways, what is the public for? I think is a really interesting challenge for the generation of public policy students coming through the university today. I want to say one thing about engagement communications. There's this thing called IAP2, and it has a spectrum, and it talks about inform. And it's actually really thoughtful in how it goes through this from informing and communications exercise right up to empowerment and real and muscular engagement. I think it's important to be careful, though, to distinguish firmly between engagement and communications, because in communications measures its success in generally one critical way, impressions, how many eyeballs. It's a quantity evaluation. It's not a quality evaluation. And what it means is that engagement then isn't just some fancy form of like communications plus. I think the way to understand engagement, and certainly the way to evaluate it, is to think about it more like governance. And how do we evaluate governance? <laughs> That's a tough one. But we think about impact. We think about results. We think about the efficacy, right? The decisions that get made and the consequences that result from it. Uh, I, I don't think we can be facile uh, when it comes to understanding the, the personal uh, impact of uh, serious engagement as it, as it was for the, that woman I described or at an organizational level when the Ottawa Hospital starts to um, think about its patient population as an essential resource in the decision-making process, much less to the kind of confidence that you then inspire um, uh, at a ministerial level. I've given a detailed presentation about this PwC project to over 800 Ministry of Health people. And the Deputy Minister made a video saying that, in fact, uh, he wanted to see cabinet submissions and policy memos make reference uh, to the citizen document. That's overturning a lot of those assumptions and demonstrating the resourcefulness of that public as an essential ingredient in policy making. This is about skills for citizenship, too. You know, uh, Peter Levine uh, from Tufts University, a big American prof on this stuff, says that unless citizens can successfully manage projects and groups, right, we're left to the mercies of the state and the market. Further, by co-managing our own associations, I love this, we develop reasonable ideas about how to address larger public issues. It's a practice. It's a culture. It can't be a one-off, either for the public or for those organizations. Um, Obviously, what I'm trying to like nudge all of our work towards is this idea of public engagement as public learning. They're flip sides of the same coin. And taken together, what I think it, it points towards is a kind of 21st century idea of public leadership. I have three kind of mass aphorisms to end with that kind of try and draw it together. And they shouldn't come as a surprise to you by this point. Building on that last bit, it used to be about public leadership. It used to be that elections, obviously, they give you mandates, right? The people have spoken. Not only because of the fact that often people are elected uh, far less than a plurality, especially at the municipal level. Uh, I don't think it's credible to say that you are elected with a mandate. The, the privilege of being elected is the privilege of office. And the privilege of office is having the opportunity to then go out and create a mandate in the space between elections. But that's a very different way of looking at it. Yeah? The second is that people want a say. People are always clamoring for a say. But they're also willing to serve. Right? And they're not serving government. They're serving themselves. They're serving the community, the society to which they belong. Lastly, the problem at the end of the day has never been that we've been asking too much of people. The problem, uh, I think, in which over the course of our five years at least, we've tried to demonstrate, um, is that we're not asking enough. And if we 
have the courage to ask a little bit more uh, in slightly different ways, uh, I think we'll all be pleasantly surprised. So I'm going to pause there. Thank you.